Okay, right, it's uh, it's 7 p.m. So uh, let's begin. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first of this year's Community Conversation series, webinar series uh, organised by the Chittislow Committee of Llandoshan Town Council. Uh, in case you've not heard of Chittislow or have heard but are not sure what's it, what it's about, uh, Tlangothlin was awarded Chittislow town status in 2013, thanks to a coordinated effort by residents and councillors at the time. We've joined over 200 other Chittislow towns around the world, with this state, and this status recognises the town's commitment to economic, social and environmental sustainability, our unique heritage and our caring attitude towards visitors and residents alike. And I believe Tlangothlin is a Chittislow town in its very DNA, where other towns work towards it. I, I really feel we live it daily through the very many community groups that make our town what it is, and as has become very apparent during the past couple of years with, with our response to, to coronavirus. With, with these webinars, which each consider a different, different Chittislow theme, we'll speak with members of some of the local groups and from further afield to hear what they're up to and how those groups see the future for our, ta our town uh, or be inspired by ideas from, from other, other groups. Some of the ideas may be familiar and others new, and so we hope that the speakers provoke discussion in the town. Uh, there'll be time for questions uh, on this webinar once the presentations have finished, uh, and, uh, and then we, the Chittislow are always open to, to further discussion any other time at our, our regular meetings. This evening, we have three speakers who will each speak for 10 minutes. The first speaker is Ben Wilcox-Jones from Denbyshire Active Travel. The second will be Angela Jones from Snowdonia, uh, the Snowdonia National Park, looking at parking and travel ideas they've been exploring there. And then Beth Ward from Drosy Bikes, a community interest company here in Clangothlen. We'll hear what each of them have to say, and I'll uh, be encouraging them to keep on time uh, with uh, a one minute warning before their 10 minutes is up. Uh, if you have questions or comments uh, for any uh, anyone listening in, please do feel free to use the comment function, the, the chat function, uh, which I believe is, should be at the top of your screen. And we'll also take verbal questions uh, uh, after the, the speakers have finished. We will uh, wrap up around 8 p.m. Uh, once, um, once everyone's finished uh, so that we keep to time. So handing over to our first speaker, uh, Ben, if I can ask you to... Uh, begin. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as Robin says, I'm Ben, and I'm the principal active travel and road safety engineer for Denbyshire County Council. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll give a sort of a fairly brief explanation about what active travel is and, and how we operate within the parameters of active travel at Denbyshire County Council, and then we can talk a bit more about Clan Gotland and some of the work that we're doing in the town. So. Um, in 2013, Welsh Government introduced the Active Travel Act Wales, which is essentially a way of managing and setting the standard for the delivery of new walking and cycling routes in Wales. Um, it's centred around urban centres with a population of above 2,000 people. And it's about really um, introducing new routes for walking and cycling that are going to engender a real um, transition and create more active travel journeys. Um, so the definition of active travel is um, a journey that's undertaken for utility purposes to a place of work, um, to a school, and it's typically a journey of less than three miles. And it doesn't really relate to leisure walking and cycling in the terms that Welsh Government wish to apply it to local authorities. So essentially we work with Welsh Government and Transport for Wales to develop active travel maps for each of our communities in Denbyshire that have a population above 2000. There's a map of our existing routes, which are designated as active travel routes, and there's an aspirational map of routes that we'd like to build. We, we have maps for each of our communities, and obviously Flangothlin is included in that. Um, just last year, um, or just recently, actually, we finished upgrading those maps. Um, they were first done in 2017. We've just done them on a mass public engagement that we've done for the Denbyshire. We had about 900 respondents to that. And as a result of that, we've developed new maps for each of our communities, which show our existing network and the routes that we'd like to build. Um, we had approximately, I had a look earlier, 60 comments from Clangothlin residents as part of that process about the sort of um, improvements that they'd like to see in the town of Clangothlin. Um, 
I sort of quickly scrutinised those before I joined this evening to see what sort of comments we had. And, and they didn't generally relate to um, people wishing to see an active travel route between point A and point B, for example. Not many people said I live in the Penguin residential area and I want an active travel route to be built to the town centre. The comments were far more um, specific to problems that people face. So um, a short section of pavement on Abbey Street, on Abbey Road, sorry, for example, is too narrow or a particular junction is difficult to cross. So what we've done, and they will be published in a few months, once they've been approved by Welsh Government, is we've created these maps and we'll be able to share these maps with anyone who participates in these meetings, with any Denbyshire residents who want to see. And what it effectively means, I guess, is that for us to bid to Welsh Government for funding in the future to build any active travel routes, the routes must be on the maps that we've developed. If they're not on the maps, we can't bid for funding for them. That's a that's a critical point. So we're talking about active travel, as I dis discussed earlier, as I described earlier, I should say. And we've developed these maps and I was talking to Robin about it earlier. Robin had some sort of, you know, some suggestions and we had the conversation around, well, it, can we bid to Welsh Government for funding for things that aren't on the maps? And unfortunately, we can't, um, but we can update those maps intermittently within the three year period. So if we receive positive suggestions through the group or residents of Langothland, we can continuously update these maps and then potentially bid for funding to develop these routes. So the development process itself is almost like a rolling three year process where you ask TFW and Welsh Government for funding for a particular route. So for instance, if we wanted to do the route in Langothland, along the riverside from the town centre to the Aldi retail area, somewhere like that, as a as an active travel route, we would initially ask them for some grant funding to start the development process. So that's public engagement, design work, um, transport assessment work, that kind of stuff. And we would slowly over a three year period start working up through the design process until we have an on the shelf active travel route that we can bid for capital funding to construct at the end of that process. Um, as I said, it's a rolling process. We already have a number of active travel routes across the whole of Denbyshire. There are various stages of that process that some of them we're taking baby steps with at the moment and starting some of that transport planning work. Some of them were getting to the detailed design stage, looking to bid for grant funding for the forthcoming financial year. Um, the schemes that range from anything from sort of potentially 60, 70,000 pounds for small schemes, up to two, three million pounds potentially that we're looking at, depending on the scale and the scope of the work that we um, that we wish to undertake. And I guess it's also important to say that um, when we submit an application to build an active travel route, it's a competitive scored grant funding um, process that we undertake with Welsh Government. So, you know, no, our desire to build an active travel route in Clangothlen or any other part of Denbyshire doesn't guarantee that we're going to get funding to do that. We have to have um, discussions with the funding body. We have to fill in capital grant funding application forms. We have to meet their scoring criteria based on things like um, projected usage levels, the number of utility journeys that that active travel route could create and that kind of stuff and really develop a positive picture which will enable us to bring in the grant funding to build those kind of routes. Um, and, and, and as we move forwards, the, the one change that we're looking to do in Denbyshire, which you know some of you will be aware of, I've met a number of you before, would be that we're looking to do far more um, collaborative work with town councils, community councils, with the public, bring in people on board with us as we go through that journey. Um, the next step in the process for us is to, you know, the more public support we get, the more favour and the more um, support we will receive from Welsh Government because it's intrinsic to the process that they want to see. They want the public to be part of the design process because they think it will enable more people and encourage more people to build the active travel routes that we create once they're constructed. And, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware and some of you I know have met the Deputy Minister in, me in meetings with me. There's, there's a real um, desire across the whole of Wales to make walking and cycling as um, an equal to or more um, more prominent than, than car journeys for short journeys of less than three miles. They want people to step out of their front door and think, well, I need to go to 
work or the leisure centre or school walking is easier for me to do than getting in my car because the facilities have been built by the local authority. They feel that that is the best way to make more people walk and cycle to um, make a difference to climate change, um, reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere to public health, um, obesity, um, pressure on the highway network, all those kind of things. Um, in the past, we've sort of focused more on there's, there's been less focus on a specific type of delivery of walking and cycling routes. Some have been linking communities, some have been recreational in nature, some have been active travel based. And I don't think Welsh Government believe that enough people have ditched their car and taken up walking or cycling based on the way we've done it in the past. So there's going to be more of a focused and um, deliberate move towards short active travel journeys to see if they can make a massive cultural change. So that's the sort of the process. I could talk about it for hours. So um, that's a sort of quick description of what we do. And in terms of Flangothlen, we have created these maps. Um, we've identified an existing network of active travel routes. Some of them are just pedestrian routes. A small number of routes which are used by cyclists and pedestrians at the moment. And what we intend to do once the maps are ratified is that we are going to in, work with a consultant. The consultant is going to review all of the active travel routes that we would like to build in Langoflin, which have been identified through the engagement process. They are going to assess them against the criteria that are set out in the Active Travel Act design guidance to see what work needs to be undertaken to bring them up to standard. We're going to put a few high level cost estimates against each of those, and then we're going to sort of prioritise them in terms of what we feel are the most deliverable. And potentially which ones will create the highest usage levels of new walking and cycling. And then following that, we will do some public engagement around Flankoflin about those active travel routes that we're looking at, seeing what the residents think, the town council think, and move forwards to doing some of that design work that I talked about earlier for active travel routes in Flankoflin. And, and I guess I would just finish by saying Flankoflin, as Robin referenced earlier, is very unique in Denbyshire. Um, the fact that it's in a, a tight valley with um, sort of hills on both the north and southern sort of um, approaches to the town make it difficult to build your traditional shared use cycle routes that would comply with the government, Welsh Government's Active Travel Act. So we're going to have to be quite creative in the town, I would suggest, to see what improvements we can make and, and maybe focus on some of the key areas like Penguin and um, routes to the medical healthcare center and to some of the retail centers and that kind of thing. You know, apologies. I know I've sort of um, not stopped talking and not taken a breath probably in the last seven or eight minutes. So um, yeah, please just feel free to come back at me with any questions now or later on when we have a discussion. That was great and spot on time. I did try to give you a one minute warning, but I realized I was uh, <laughs> on mute. So, uh, um, but you were spot on time. So thank you for that. Um, just two very specific questions before I go to the next speaker. Um, you mentioned the maps are going to be ratified and then available. Can I just check what kind of timeline that that would be? I believe they're going to do it by the end of the financial year. So by the end of um, March, obviously they're, they're keen to get it done before the, um, the election period comes in and we move on to the local elections. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I've got other questions, but I'll hold them till till the end and unless other people have a chance as well. But thank you for that uh, that run through. Um, just before I hand over to Angela, um, can I ask anybody that's uh, not speaking, could you please just put your microphones on mute as well um, so that we avoid background noise? Um, so, uh, yeah, having uh, had a, a, a run through active travel from Flagathlin, I'd like to take a step back to look at things on a North Wales perspective and, and hear what's going on in Snowdonia. Um, that we might be able to learn from as, as we look at traffic and parking uh, here in Llangollen. Uh, over to Angela. Thank you very much, Robin. Yeah, and thank you for the invitation to come and uh, have a chat with you all this evening. So I have got some slides. I'm hoping um, Gareth is going to share them on my behalf. And just to let you know that um, I am Partnerships Manager for Snowdonia National Park Authority. I'm usually doing this presentation with the uh, the Partneritha Roedfa, so the, the Snowden Partnership Officer. 
and uh, that's why you see her name on the oh, we don't see it but if you go to view gareth and full screen or play then i guess yeah maybe that one yeah no that goes to the next page is it possible to go to full screen or oh, yeah that's it maybe zoom out perfect so you can see yeah that's it that's the whole slide there Brilliant. So, yeah, and the reason that I mentioned the Snowden Partnership Officer is because this strategy that we've got at the moment is very specific to Aroiva, to Snowden and to the Ogwen area. So a small part of the National Park, but probably the bit that's the most visited and where we have these issues that you can see on your screen right now. And you've probably seen some of this on um, you know, various news items, certainly over the last couple of years. And when we reopened after lockdown, we had some real issues on this is the Llamberis path, which is a clear way. And this was actually one of the better days where there was only parking along one side of the road. We did have one day where it was along both sides of the road and it was extremely dangerous and it, uh, emergency vehicles couldn't actually access uh, Pennant Pass, which is our main car park there at the top to, to get up to Snowdon. So we worked through the Snowdon Partnership to actually get a, a, a review of the, the whole area done by a team of consultants called Martin Higgett Associates. And I think if you go to the next slide, it shows you some of what, oh yeah, this is the area that I was describing. So that very defined kind of Snowdon and Ogwen area. And on the next slide, I think it shows you a little bit about their, what they discovered were the core issues. Not surprising, but similarly to what you've said to me, that demand for car-based access at peak times really massively outstrips the amount of available parking in the area. And this has a huge impact on obviously the people who live and work in the area full time, as well as, of course, on habitats and the environment, etc. But one of the things that they concluded was this last point, which I love, was that this is an actually exciting opportunity for us to really transform the area and to have a completely new think about how we do parking and transport in the entire region. And what they recommended on the next slide is something that is uh, based on a sustainable tourism model. Now, this is pretty, uh, it's a complete change of of thought, if you like, or a mindset change for everyone who lives and works in the area. And in the long term, it aims at a high quality carbon neutral shuttle bus service being operated throughout the area and visitors will arrive by public transport or park at gateway sites where frequent low cost or even free buses, depending on who's investing in this, will be available for people to to travel around the area and eventually parking in that inner area that I showed you earlier will be reduced or possible only with pre-booking or with permits but parking will be expanded in gateway villages or in strategic park and ride locations and to do all this we need to look at a new funding model which would include the idea of a visitor contribution. On the next slide it just mentions that this is um, inspired by we look to a lot of kind of overseas and international examples and this has been specifically inspired by um, a, a village in Austria where villagers actually came together and decided themselves to create a sustainable tourism and transport offer when you arrive at Wurfingwen, this place, you actually leave your car behind for the whole time that you stay there and you are guaranteed mobility or guaranteed travel around the area on any form of transport at all with what's called a mobile card. So using those principles and one of the really interesting things that this village discovered when they put these principles in place was it actually attracted young residents back to the area because there was a lot of um, potential for entrepreneurial ideas and for new business models. And of course, that's one of the things that we really want to do in the Snowdonia area as well. So, um, it outlines the strategy overall. I've given you a really brief taste of it there, but it outlines several benefits that we see for the area. On the next slide, it shows you some of the most obvious ones being for the environment. 
So here are some examples of those. And it does look at a very comprehensive and holistic future which replaces cars with zero modes of transport around the area. And of course, this requires significant behavioural change for all of us who live and work in the area as well as visit there. And also on the next slide, it shows some of the uh, benefits we're hoping to see for the local economy. Uh, and these all link in at the moment with a vision of the local authorities, with us as a National Park Authority, and with, of course, some of the main policies coming out of Welsh Government at the moment as well. But on the next slide, it also mentions an opportunity for us to kind of rebrand the area as well. Um, and we want to be, you know, up there in the world's leading sustainable tourism destination, but also we want to influence the cultural change, not only just in how people move around and think about the area, but also in what we emphasise about the area. So some of the special qualities of the National Park that do get overlooked, for example, you know, the Welsh language, the amazing culture and, uh, culture and heritage that we have in the area, the myths and legends, and the fact that it is a place of cohesive communities who come together to work together to make these things happen. So um, it's all very, very exciting. Um, there are a couple of other potential benefits here very quickly. I mean, I won't go into them in detail, but one of the key things about the strategy is that it's based on what people in the area want to see. And it works with specifically four gateway communities to do a master plan and exercise on how they want to see the future and how they want to shape their areas around this sustainable tourism model. Um, and we have had some investment from Welsh Government through Transport for Wales to put in place some of these initial projects. And the next series of slides just kind of gives you a couple of examples of those. Um, so, yeah, if you just kind of click through these, Gareth, and you will see some of them. So we've we've done um, some consultation already with core communities. We've put in place, you may have heard of a pilot free booking system at Penna Pass this year, uh, last year now, of course which uh, was controversial but was extremely successful. We've also, uh, Transport for Wales are also working on the active travel agenda with us and we're looking at developing an area-wide cycle hire scheme and looking at e-bike scheme and also um, improving the active travel and leisure travel routes available in the area. Um, and we've looked into a wider kind of public transport and parking management strategy as well. So there's a lot going on. It's um, it's in its early, early stages, but we hope you agree that this is an extremely ambitious, uh, integrated, holistic strategy that really hits that momentum for change and a movement towards a sort of sustainable future that we're currently seeing politically and economically and socially in a constructive and positive way. Um, we, you know, we hit such stumbling blocks like everyone does working with so many different partners, but I think the vision for this is quite clear and is bringing everyone around the table to, to look forward to this hopefully more sustainable future and a better system for everybody to be able to, to move around the area. So I haven't had my one minute warning, but I'm pretty much there. So hopefully um, I didn't talk too much. And obviously I'm more than happy to go into any of these things in more detail later if they're relevant to you. Um, so on the very last slide there, Gareth, I'll say diolch yn and thank you very much. Diolch yn fawr, Angela, thank you. And uh, you didn't even reach your uh, your your nine minutes, so um, oh, you didn't get well, warning, could have but, talked a lot I'm more. Sure, I'm sure that we can come <laughs> back to you uh, with questions, and I'm particularly keen to hear about your experiences. I saw the horse and cart in the uh, in the model, so you know how you're rolling out the horse and cart option for uh, for people uh, locally. Um, that's that's really inspiring to hear. Um, we will move on uh, to the last speaker and then we'll open for, for questions. Uh, so can I ask uh, Beth uh, from Drosy Bikes um, if, uh, if you can be spotlighted and hand over to you. Thank you. Um, so I, my name is Beth Ward. I'm co-founder of Drosy Bikes. We're a community interest company and we're based in Llangollen. Um, so we're coming from much more of a grassroots community perspective than Angela and Ben. Uh, and ben. But I'll give you a bit of an overview of what we've been up to and then talk about, about what our plans are for this coming year as well. So we um, we started in 20, May 2020. We were working from home for the first 12 months. And in May last year, we set up the Community Bike Workshop in Llangollen. Um, 
the whole purpose of Drossy Bikes is to tackle the environmental crisis. That's where we started. Um, and that's that's that kind of our reason for being. Um, we, we're doing this by promoting bikes as an environmental environmentally friendly or sustainable mode of transport by um, diversifying the cycling community. So at the moment, uh, men are twice as likely as women are to use a bicycle, and we're trying to cha- we're trying to change that and tackle that and encourage more women, young people, people from uh, minority groups to use bikes instead of cars. Um, and then we're also trying to reduce waste going to landfill. So we I'll talk a bit more more about how um, in a in a minute. Um, so we the last twelve months or nine months since May. Um, we have been recycling and refurbishing donated bikes. So members of the public will drop off old bikes that they're um, going to take to landfill. They'll drop them off with us. We'll either recycle them for parts, make sure they get recycled properly or reused, um, or we'll refurbish them and sell them on at an affordable price. Um, to date, we've recycled over 100 bikes, and that's predominantly from people in Llangollen. So goodness knows how many um, empty sheds there are now. Um, so we've also, with regards to making cycling more accessible, so we run Dr. Bike Workshops. So these are um, pop-up workshops where we take our bike mechanic to locations across uh, Demshire or North Wales. We've been as far as Bangor running these workshops. And that really is about promoting active travel within organisations. So helping um, places like Bangor University support their students and their staff to cycle to and from work and we'll do that by offering a free bike uh, free bike repairs to the staff and the students on site so we're looking in the future to kind of grow this area of what we do um, and access more rural communities we work with Penguen and Pentradool um, and um, Araris as well over towards Loggerheads running these workshops and um, we also our workshop is um, I guess our goal is to make it as inclusive as we possibly can so we offer a very affordable non-judgmental bike shop if anyone's ever been to a bike shop before you might find that it's um, quite elitist um, shiny bikes expensive bikes quite often people feel overwhelmed going into them um, and uncomfortable so we're we're all about making everyone feel comfortable um, in the workshop And then we've also been offering bikes and electric bikes for a discount to locals to try and promote active travel um, and bicycles within Llangollen area. Um, And then we run drop-in workshops. So these are DIY workshops where people can use our workshop tools and expertise for free, bring down their bikes and we'll help them fix it um, on site. So we run these, we're going to be running them monthly over the next 12 months and we have run them over, over the last 12 months as well. Um, with regards to diversifying the cycling community, so this is a um, particular area of passion for me, being a cyclist. Um, we've been running women-specific workshops, so uh, we invite women from all kind of backgrounds or expertise or level of knowledge with regards to bike repairs into our workshop for an evening session, teaching them how to repair um, and maintain their own bikes. And we're also um, we've also run some cycle confidence sessions, so helping people who don't feel comfortable on road cycling, teaching them to cycle, teaching them how um, to cycle safely on the roads so that they're or hopefully more likely to use a bicycle in the future. Um, we've got funding to run uh, some more both cycle confidence sessions and women specific sessions, so organised rides, all in the name of kind of getting more people from more diverse range of backgrounds onto bikes. Uh, we've been upskilling and empowering people through these workshops and we also have volunteer opportunities so we've got I think around 10 or 12 volunteers who come into our workshop um, weekly and help out with our donated bikes um, it's a kind of win-win it helps us because <laughs> get through the pile of bikes that we have donated but it also means that they're learning more about bike maintenance and um, it gives them something to do um, get out the house and it's also a very social activity bringing them in and we also run bike maintenance training courses so these are slightly more commercial um, and helps us generate some income to maintain the workshop in Llangollen. Um, and lastly one of the most important things that we do is showcase how bikes and electric bikes can be used um, both my partner and I have been using our electric bikes to commute to work. We live over towards Rithin and cycle to Slang or have been cycling over the Horseshoe Pass to Slangoshan on our electric bikes. We've been ta- using the bikes to um, go to Dr. Bike Workshop, so towing a trailer. 
um, with all of our parts. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to talk a bit more about how we'll do this this year coming. But we've worked out recently what cycling to and from work over the summer has meant with regards to the environment. We've saved between the two of us 0.6 tonnes of CO2 emissions. We've saved £500 on fuel. Uh, we've burned over 30,000 calories and we've spent 125 hours cycling through the beautiful North Wales countryside. So if anyone ever argues that cycling is um, a waste of time, you, you've got some of the ammo there to kind of counteract that. Um, so the future of cycling or the opportunities that we have coming up. So we're very young as an organisation, we're a social enterprise, but we've only been going for 12, 18 months. Um, what we want to do now, we've been focusing very much on individuals and changing individuals' behaviours. Um, we really want to look a bit more at businesses, communities as a whole. Um, how can we start seeing more kind of less vans, less delivery drivers on the roads? We've got funding to buy a cargo bike or an electric cargo bike, which is a bike with a massive box on the front or the back, which means that you can um, transport goods, packages, um, shopping, children around town. So we've got funding to purchase one of them and we're going to hopefully be working with local businesses and families to, to trial this, to pilot it in Llangollen um, to see how this can work um, around the town to reduce the, tra the traffic on the roads. Um, we we're also looking at how we can utilise the refurbished bikes a bit more. So we've been selling them but we're, we'd like to work with um, people who can't afford to buy them and kind of really understand how we can use these bikes to give them the opportunity to travel around um, either commute to work or just to travel for their own um, purposes and then also how we can upskill um, a wider range of people work with more volunteers or uh, minority groups to get them involved in cycling in Denbyshire or Llangollen specifically. Some of the challenges that we've faced over the last 12 months, and I foresee the challenges that we'll continue to face over the next 12 months, um, being infrastructure, the common kind of um, uh, backlash when we try and encourage people to cycle is them, them saying that they don't feel safe on the roads. We're doing what we can to overcome this, offering the cycle confidence sessions, um, showing people safe, safe routes to cycle locally, but it all it always comes back to infrastructure and lack of and not feeling safe on the roads um and there's also um something to be said for the lack of appetite from businesses and larger organizations to change their behaviors um how and so this is something that we're looking at challenging um but it's definitely it's a slow burn i guess it's going to take a lot of work um and it's not going to be a quick fix i suspect and then the age old problem of funding. Um, so we are social enterprise, so we do generate money, but a lot of these activities that we're offering are free um, to the end user um, because we are trying to promote it and encourage more people to take part. And it's us understanding how we can best um, either self fund or kind of get funding from, um, from grants to make sure that we are as sustainable and we are here long term. And I don't know how long that's taken, but that's me. Um, so thank you very much. And please do ask any questions um, in the chat or later on. That's brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Beth. Um, uh, and uh, my husband has actually this evening been at one of your workshops, uh, the DIY workshops. So, uh, you know, being well used. Um, really amazing. And, and particularly you know, to, to hear the stats about the uh, everything from calories burnt, hours hours biked, and I think importantly, money saved um, is always a compelling reason, isn't it? Um, I guess just um, uh, we're going to to move to the the open discussion uh, section now. Um, before we do, if I can just ask um, uh, people to make sure their their microphones are on mute, um, and uh, and there's nothing in the background behind you um, that you might not want people to see. Um, those that were on one of our seminars last year, our webinars last year, will remember <laughs> where that point came from. Um, <laughs> and um, there was a shower incident. Um, uh, so uh, if we can open to the uh, to the discussion, maybe if I, if people can uh, want to ask any questions, uh, there is a chat function available, um, or you can also raise your hand. You should be able to see both of those options on on the bar. 
Um, but if neither of those work for you, then do just jump in. Maybe if I could start with one question uh, to that goes across the three areas, really, um, and maybe a couple of points from, from each of you. Um, what would you say are the key barriers to getting people out of their cars? Um, Beth, you, you touched on, on one um, being infrastructure. Any, any other barriers? Uh, maybe uh, go back to Beth and then uh, Angela and, uh, and Ben. Yeah, I think there's um, a cultural shift that's needed. I think it's habit that we get into it. We kind of go to our cars as the first kind of uh, point of call. So I think there's culturally what we do as a nation, but also um, what we see other people do. So if we see more people out on bikes, we're more likely to pick the bikes up ourselves. But at the moment, it's just not the norm. Um, so that needs to change. Thank you. Angela? Yeah, I mean, that's a massive question that we're looking at at the moment. Probably uh, we're looking more about shifting people onto public transport, although obviously encouraging cycling and walking routes as well at the same time. But I mean, what we think is people are only going to be prepared to leave their cars if the alternative is more efficient and more effective, more attractive. Um, so that, I think that's an absolutely key. You know, the public transport that we're offering or encouraging, going to be encouraging, has to be something that's part of the experience of the area as well. And that it's reliable, which is what we're hearing from all of the communities that we're consulting with, and that it meets their needs. So, for example, you know, a lot of our public transport buses, the Sherpa Ruifa, which is the, the Snowden Sherpa that kind of goes around the foot of the mountain to all of the local communities and, and drops people off, picks people up. It stops at the moment at 6 p.m. Well, in the middle of the summer, when we've got walkers obviously on the hills until about 10 o'clock, it just doesn't meet those needs and it doesn't, it's not safe either, you know. So um, we're looking at kind of demand responsive transport for to meet that need. So I think, yeah, the alternative has to be, it has to be attractive, it has to be efficient, it has to meet people's needs, doesn't it? So, yeah. That's, um, that's great. And um, one of the options for speakers tonight was um, uh, maybe for a future webinar was the flexi um, trans uh, demand uh, responsive uh, travel that's being piloted uh, elsewhere in Denbyshire. Um, which um, you know, at one point we'd love to hear how that's going and see if that's something that would, would support Clangothlin as well. Um, and uh, Ben, um, your thoughts on, on getting people out of their cars? Yeah, um, I guess the two things that we have an opportunity to influence people with, and it goes one of them goes back to something that Beth said about confidence. We invest a lot of time and resources in um, providing training and education for young people about how they should walk and cycle. Um, but there's a generation of older people, and, I, and I'll categorise myself in that generation, who, who weren't given that same opportunity in the past, and, and they lack confidence. It's um, And it's something we're trying to resolve by developing a programme of family active travel training, which we hope to um, roll out and provide an opportunity for for people at Denbyshire. Um, there may be something centred around the um, Flank Otland 2020 scheme to do that. We're working with our contractor to see if we can fund something locally for Langothlan residents to sort of breed more confidence. And I guess from a route user's perspective, if if bike using a bike or walking is gonna be as appealing or more appealing than using a car, we need to make sure that the facilities that we build are of a really, really high standard, not just from a construction standpoint, but also from an environmental standpoint, you know, up until recently, you could get money, lots of money to put curbs on the ground and to do drainage, but you couldn't get money to do enhancements like trees, um, sud systems, um, benches, whatever it may be. And, and, and that's starting to change a little bit now. Um, and, and the funding authorities are, are more open to having discussions about what you can do to enhance a route to more, make more people use it. So we need to build quality provision, which is really appealing with excellent street lighting and all that kind of stuff. So you feel comfortable, safe, confident. And and, and I think those are the kind of things as officers for, for Denbyshire, certainly that we can influence and are, are very prominent in our minds. That's great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would also add integrated as well. With um, I'm, I'm a keen cyclist and user of public transport. And if I could take my bus and get it onto a bike, then that would be all my problems solved. So um, uh, to throw that challenge into the mix as well. Yeah, sorry, Robin. And, and the other thing that just came to me then is we need to do more with developers as well. 
we, we deal with developers on a daily basis building residential estates um, large industrial premises we need to make sure that they are playing their part and, and that the provision at the at the point the journey starts in the residential estate needs to be up to stand and it's something we're really trying to get better at as an authority as well thank you any questions from uh, anyone really uh speakers or, or audience Sheena, I can see you've got your hands up and then uh, yeah. Paul and Angela. I was going to say, I, I like the idea that the public are being asked more for their views and for their ideas. And you were on about, um, you just touched on something there, bus routes and developers. Um, I live up in Penguin and both roads going down into town, they've got pinch points, um, I did used to cycle a lot. I wouldn't feel confident cycling and going down onto the A5. But one thing that I would like being considered is as more houses are being built, the facility to expand the bus routes to take in where people really want to go. For instance, I can go from Penguin down into town. In the morning, I can also go across to the health centre. I would really like it if I went from Penguin and you could go down the back way, the Plas Nowid way. There's a whole new estate there. There's a whole community there. Pick up people in that area, take them into town, but go along via Aldi, Home Bargains, back into town and the health centre, picking up the points where the public really want to go to. Um, I don't use a car, so I always think as a pedestrian, and we were talking earlier on, and one thing I'm really pleased about the new pavements in town is they're wide, they're safe, they're, they're nice and clean, nice clean lines. You feel confident walking on them. Um, you can tell pedestrians have been to the forefront. <laughs> You've thought about them first instead of always thinking about the cars, because when you get out of your car, you become a pedestrian. Um, so that's just little points you know, that I think are, are positive. They could be built on, but ask the public where they really want to go in the buses. Get me out the car and you take us where we want to go and we'll always go in the bus. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Um, Mel. You're on mute still. Uh, yeah, I just trying to, there trying, you go. Trying to find it. Um, I'm embarrassed now that I don't have a bike. Um, I used to have a bike, but I stopped when I was 15. But one thing I would sort of, you know, need if I did have a bike would be a safe place to park it when I left it somewhere. And I know that in Clan we've got a little area by, um, by the toilets there where you can sort of hook up a bike somewhere. Um, it's in between the butty box and the toilet, I think. Um, can't really get too much in there. And the same thing, there's an area outside the library. Um, um, you know, it's, it's very small. So I suppose we need to encourage more of these areas so that people can, you know, feel confident in... I mean, bikes are expensive, even though Drossy are doing a good deal on you know producing on providing bikes i mean you can spend you know how much is an electric bike several thousand quid you know down to 500 quid maybe but um you know i'm just saying that it'd be good to have a, a little garage for bikes as well yeah just uh, sorry, to follow up on that robin thanks it's a really good point and, and what we found when we previously looked at cycle storage across denbyshire is that people don't want to leave their bikes in a um, sort of away from where they are you know they want to leave it if they're going into a particular shop they want to chain it up outside that shop because that bike is really important to them it can often be quite expensive and and sort of communal bike storage hasn't worked very well or been very popular in some areas you know some people are running bikes that cost two three thousand pounds you know and they want to be able to see them at all times so it, it it's a difficult thing to do particularly in a town like Flan where space is at a premium and 
it's it's how we work through that and maybe public engagement is a really good thing to do in a town like clan to find out what people want and what works best for them great thank you anything else on that beth for angela otherwise i'll go straight to angela um angela over to you yeah i just wanted to say really um, ben said this earlier but you know welsh government from what i've seen they're so focused on these issues at the moment and there's a major drive to get people out of their cars that if you do have ideas or if you do have you know um just the makings of a strategy and can get some partners together um there is funding available for lots of lots of different groups and lots of different kind of schemes at the moment uh, and i just think it's, it's really like this is the time get out there be bold you know and really put your ideas forward because yeah massive change is on the horizon for us all i think so we've got to grasp that that's a really really good point i guess that goes to one of the other questions i had is um it's, it's mostly to ben but i appreciate other perspectives too that you know uh, like clangoughlin is is currently considering uh its place plan a, a plan for the town and there's a um, an initial draft of of kind of ideas um, as as that gets more specific around uh, some of these issues around uh, tra uh, transport and travel, um, if there are particular ideas, how would you suggest? Um, you know, should, it seems like maybe there's like some kind of consensus building that that needs to happen because if you're only getting around, you said you mentioned sixty responses um, to to the consultation so far, and they're not quite the right. Uh, they're not the kind of suggestions maybe <clears throat> that you were looking for you know is there are there opportunities you know what would you suggest really um that community groups do or, or individual residents do to to get their ideas out there to build uh build, build awareness of them i think you know i'm i'm really in favor and would be really supportive to work with a flangotland group you know to, to participate in the work that you're doing um, and to see how active travel can influence your town plan and the transport plan and then to see what steps we can take collaboratively to build on that engagement that you do because really strong engagement is really helpful for me when we want to bid for grant funding the stronger the engagement the more community involvement um, the better and Clan Gothland 2020 is a fantastic example of that it was to a great extent a community-led scheme for a long period of the development of the scheme and we've ended up being able to draw down the best part of, I don't know, a million pounds near enough of grant funding towards our scheme and, and the community development and, and the work that you guys have done and that we've collaborated on as we've gone has been really helpful. So just, I think the, the com initially the communication between me, my team and you guys to see what we can take forward and how we can develop that and have a partnership approach wherever possible really. That's great. Thank you, uh, Ben. And I guess I would also say in return, um, you know, the the obviously the Flangoffin Town Council meets monthly. So, you know, if you are going out to consultation, then um, certainly letting the, the councillors know, coming and giving an update to the councillors and asking them to use their networks um, to, to get the word out. Um, and then Chittislow as a, a committee has, has a, a strong mailing list as well and, and regular meetings so um again if there's ways that we can help to get the word out about consultations we you know please do reach out on that i can see a couple of other hands up um so um can i i think i saw david robinson first and then andy lewis olding david do you want to start thank you um in uh, january 2021 welsh government policy was to uh, introduce 20 mile an hour zones in in uh, communities um i see that as something that would encourage a lot more activity on cyclists wherever they are i'm walking um what's what's the view from the denbyshire's point of view um thanks dave um good evening i, I know dave quite well um so 20 miles an hour is going to become the new norm in wales from 2023 onwards on what they call restricted roads so what that basically means is that roads within urban areas that are currently 30 miles an hour, so pretty much the whole of Llangollen, for example, will become 20 miles an hour in 2023. We're currently working with WG 
to work out the process as to how that will take place because there's an awful amount of administration traffic regulation orders consultation and all that kind of stuff money is required to do it but the outcome is going to be in 2023 20 mile an hour will replace 30 mile an hour in almost all cases across wales we, we would have to build a case to welsh government to retain a 30 miles an hour and, and we don't intend to do that apart from in one or two isolated cases in other areas of denbyshire so you're dead right dave it's going to make pedestrians and cyclists more confident it's going to hopefully reduce the number of collisions that take place have air quality benefits and on all that kind of stuff and um i think it's april 23 is the um proposed date that that's going to come in i'm excited about it already maybe sheena we can find out if that would be the date for you to get back on your bike and uh, and on the a5 um uh, very exciting and can i just check ben um does that will that then have a knock-on effect for like for 40 mile an hour zones on the outskirts of town then then go down to 30 or it would go it seems odd if it would go straight from 20 miles an hour up to 40. um, um it, it, that the discussions around that are taking place at the moment there are different views across wales and they're looking for some consistency and some guidance from Welsh Government because I think it's really important that what we do in Denbyshire is reflected in Flintshire, reflected in Conwy. We want motorists to um, understand how the speed limits work and that there is some consistency. Um, we don't have many buffer zones across Denbyshire really so the 40 that you described leading into a 30 is what we would call a buffer zone. Yeah. Um, we don't actually have many of those. I mean there are a couple on the approach to Thlan that we know um, at the moment that the intention is for them to stay as they are and we will have some roads which go straight from 60 to 20 that's yeah. the most likely scenario but we're working through the detail at the moment uh, I should say a conflict of interest there where I'm in a 40 zone <laughs> so um, would be pleased to see it go to 30 well I'm in a 40 my children zone as well bikes. <laughs> yeah and I my wife's always asking yeah. me can we have a 20 outside our house and all this, so I had the same could, um, could I add another element? The the um, Welsh Government on the truck road network do have the buffer zones but generally and I suppose de from Ben's point of view with local authorities is a little different but from a Welsh Government truck road uh, they, they do that. Um, they also, are, are, I have read the report prepared Welsh Government relating to how drivers would uh, drivers travel time would be affected by introducing 20 mile an hour and it's minimal so i think from a point of view of welsh government support they're, they're all behind the actual introduction of it but from a local authority point of view you've got a lot more communities to deal with than the welsh government have with their trunk roads so um i would look forward to um, that introduction you've got ben and it's a it's a big order to to, to fulfill it's a massive piece of work and thankfully I, I understand it, but I'm not involved in it on a daily basis. It's one of, it's one of those that I'm really pleased I'm not doing, to be honest. Not one of your hats. Um, yeah. Can I go on to Andy? You've been patient, Andy. Thank you. Yeah, I come very much from a, a cycling background as a bicycleity instructor. And um, I teach a lot of kids uh, to um, ride their bikes safely on the road, and it gives them a massive amount of confidence. Uh, Andy, could you speak up a bit or get closer to the microphone? Uh, yeah, sorry. Is that better? OK, um, yeah, I come from a cycling background and uh, I teach kids uh, to uh, ride their bikes safely um, through bikeability. Um, but one of the biggest things that I one of the biggest comments that I have from uh, parents and other adults is that they themselves don't feel safe on the road. Um, and it, it just concerns me that we are giving bikeability training to children to give them confidence to go on the road, but we are not giving it to adults to go out on the road. Um, and as such, there is no funding coming from anywhere to help these adults. Um, and surely some of that funding, could it not come from uh, local councils and from Welsh government, all right, to actually uh, help these people to be more confident? Um, and in turn, that would of course um, change how people think about getting on their bike, um, whether you know they would think about yes, I would ride into town rather than get on my, get in my car to go into town because they feel more confident to do it. Um, it was just a question, really, I suppose, aimed more at ben, uh, ben than anybody. Thank you. 
Well, the good news is we've already sort of identified that issue over the past 18 months. And um, I mentioned earlier that we are developing what we're badging as a family active travel training package. Um, you rightly pointed out that it's not supported by Welsh Government. They pay for bikeability for, for younger people at the moment. So we're looking at almost like a pilot scheme initially, which we are our our there's a part of it's going to be focused on Llangollen and our contractor of the Llangollen 2020 scheme is going to generously contribute to um, 10 or so family training packages that we can potentially dish out. We're, it's not finalised yet, but those are the discussions that are taking place and they're very positive. And we're also looking at maybe using some of our own revenue funding initially. Uh, and what we'd like to do is to maybe do some um, analysis of the training that we do, because um, if we want to encourage Welsh Government to support us with it long term, we need to do the training and then to actually evaluate it to sort of understand how it works, you know, from a confidence level, from a, an actual miles undertaken by the cyclists and that kind of thing. So the plan is to do the trial, gather the evidence and then present that to Welsh Government. That's um, that's great. Thank you, Andy and and Ben and and Ben. I've always I've already extended the invitation to you. You've accepted it last year. In case you've forgotten to join me and my kids on a on a trip cycle trip to school one morning, uh, to see the challenges that they navigate uh, along the way. Um, so I'll be following you up uh, following you up on that one. <laughs> um, uh, Fergus, uh, you had your hand up uh, next. Yeah. Yeah, uh, before I, thanks, you thanks for that. Others, could you just check, put your hand down if you've had your question answered? Thank you. Sorry, Fergus. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'll make a very quick point. I don't want to rain on Ben's parade, but I don't fully agree with the training of young people in the county of Denbyshire. And actually, we did an FOI request uh, before, just before COVID, and actually there's been a significant decline in most schools across the county with one or two exceptions. So we're not doing it, and we've really dropped our training levels for young people. And that's because it's a head teacher discretionary spend and for various reasons, but it has gone away. And uh, the council or the county said it could do it in house but the evidence is that it's not happening and so it's slumped i can't comment on on Klangothan schools specifically but we need to look at that and get the uh, training of young people back on track because it isn't happening uh, and it's certainly slumped however we've got to allow for the fact there's been what a year or two of covid so park that uh, robin i just wanted to say there was a really important political point made by angela in her examination of the austrian village scheme and if i could just make the point we have and again it sounds like i'm getting it back gang up slightly on Ben again but we with the councillors in Denbyshire dismantled an active travel scheme of of a kind in in um in Rithin and there are lessons for that because these schemes are very difficult to set up they take a lot of time that one may have been imperfect but what councillors of, of who are typically 60 70 80 don't always understand is that they understand their current stakeholders and their current um businesses they don't understand the future for instance presented like beth and rosie which are the alternative cafe and other social enterprises small-scale enterprises that emerge just as in the austria story that angela highlighted for us and so you ended up there with a change a very significant change in how you manage traffic coming to very popular uh, destinations a bit like and a bit like some of the snowdonia um, towns and then by doing that you suddenly find that entrepreneurs come out of the woodwork to offer all sorts of businesses and you know before you know it you've got four or five versions of Beth's business in Llangothen alone doing various things yeah and and that doesn't exist if you make the decision based on the way the world is today in Rithin High Street and that is sadly what happened there Ben of course has to do what he's told because he's an officer not a politician he does what politicians tell him I'll cut him that slack but it's not a great thing and we destroyed probably the the seed of a of a, of a scheme that would have done better for Rithin and created perhaps more of a town square. Llangothan's got that opportunity. That's enough for me. But um, um, Angela made a really telling point there. And the danger is that county councillors get it wrong by stopping things happening. And then that ends up stopping businesses like Beth's, Rosie and other similar businesses from from coming out of the woodwork. Thank you very much, Fergus. And as a town councillor myself, uh, I, I'll take that as uh, you know and, and carry that back to our, our town councillors here in Llangothen. I know there are others on the call. Um, I think we won't go into the details of, of Rithin, um, but the points are are noted. And and I think 
you know the the point Angela made about businesses opening is is very much the case. Uh, we've 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 got obviously Drosy opening up. Uh, also, another bike shop opened up. So we've now got three, whereas uh, only about five years ago we had none. Um, and for a small town with only um, around four thousand residents, that's um, you know that that's quite a a boost to the economy um, through through those three three bike shops. Um, and and you know really does show that there's there's a growing market for for that. Um, I'm gonna I'm aware of time, so um, I really think the conversation has been has been really useful and valuable and really interesting. So thank you all, thank you to all the the speakers um, for for their contribution and provoking that discussion. Um, we um, uh, we're going to wrap up quickly, but uh, just to let people listening know, um, we do have other events in this webinar series. Uh, the next one's coming up. Uh, the next one coming up is on Wednesday, January the 26th, uh, which is culture, tourism and employment. And then in February, we have uh, conversations around energy and housing uh, and environment, food and farming. And then in early March, we'll be discussing community health and well-being. Um, so please do, if, if people aren't already, please follow our Chittislow Flangotlin uh, Facebook page. Uh, and uh, it's also an opportunity there to keep up to date with what local groups are doing in the town. Um, but uh, for now, thank you all very much. And uh, I hope you have a, a very nice evening. We're going to stop the recording there. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Cheers. That's great. Thank you all. Um, particularly